Grand Orient Freemasonry unmasked as the secret power behind communism by Monsignor George F. Dillon with a preface by the Reverend Dennis Fahey. The Britain's Publishing Company is to be congratulated on reprinting this lecture on Freemasonry by the Right Reverend Monsignor George Dillon. The lecture was delivered at Edinburgh in October 1884, that is, about six months after the appearance of Pope Leo XIII's famous encyclical letter, Humanum Genus, on Freemasonry. At the request of many who had heard the lecture, and of others who had read the reports that appeared in the papers, Monsignor Dillon decided to publish it along with another lecture delivered to the same audience on the spoliation of the Congregation of Propaganda. The book was brought out by the excellent firm of M. H. Gill and Son, Limited, O'Connell Street, Dublin, in 1885, but it has long been out of print. In the original preface, the author pointed out that the lecture had not been intended to be a formal and exhaustive treatment of the subject, and that he had embodied the book in the book several documents which were only briefly referred to or partially quoted in the lecture. His object was to give a clear outline of the whole question of secret atheistic organization, its origin, its nature, its history in the last century, and in this and its unity of satanic purpose in a wonderful diversity of forms. He found that it was necessary to do because very few, if any, attempts have been made in our language to treat the subject as a whole. Several writers appear to assume as known that they was really unknown to the very many, and a few touched at all upon the fact of the supreme direction given to the universality of secret societies from a guiding, governing, and even to the rank and file of the members of the secret societies themselves, unknown and invisible junta. Monsignor Dillon does not speak explicitly of the two currents of thought and action proceeding from the Masonic French Revolution, namely, the current of Rousseauist Lockean Masonic liberalism and the current of socialism and communism. Implicitly, however, he does do so when on the one hand, he foreshadows the United States of Europe and world federalism, and, on the other, quotes the infamous Declaration of the Internationale in 1868. This declaration, formulated at the International Congress held at Geneva in 1868, and quoted by Monsignor Dillon in his preface, is well worth reproducing, at least in part. It runs as follows. The object of the International Association of Workmen, as of every other socialist association, is to do away with the parasite and the pariah. Now, what parasite can be compared to a priest? God in Christ, the citizen providences, have been at all times the armor of capital and the most sanguinary enemies of the working classes. It is owing to God and to Christ that we remain to this day in slavery. It is by deluding us with lying hopes that the priests have caused us to accept all the sufferings of this earth. It is only after sweeping away all religion, after tearing up even to the last roots every religious idea, that we can arrive at our political and social ideal. Down, then, with God and with Christ, down with the despots of heaven and earth, death to the priests, such is the motto 
of our Grand Crusade. In a note on page 20 of the original edition, Monsignor Dillon returned to the question of the direction of Freemasonry, which he had mentioned in his preface. Here, he says, the Jewish connection with fr modern Freemasonry is an established fact everywhere manifested in, in its history. The Jewish formulas employed by Freemasonry, the Jewish traditions which run through its ceremonial, point to a Jewish origin, or the work of Jewish contrivers. Who knows but behind atheism and the desire of gain which impels them to urge on Christians to persecute the church and destroy it, there lies a hidden hope to reconstruct their temple, and in the darkest depths of soci secret society plotting there lurks a deeper society still which looks to a return to the land of Judah and to the rebuilding of the temple of Jerusalem. These remarks can furnish the starting point for a deeper examination of the whole question of secret societies and their action, studied in the light of the encyclicals of the sovereign pontiffs and of history. The rejection of order by Satan and the other fallen angels was irrevocable. It was a declaration by the whole body of them together of perpetual war and implacable hatred toward the blessed trinity and the supernatural life of grace. The fall of the human race could be undone because human beings can change their minds and the human race comes into existence successively by propagation from the first atom. In the undoing of the fall, however, God permitted a second rejection of order. In spite of the fact that they had been repeatedly warned in types and figures and orally by the prophets about the way they would treat the true Messiah when he came, the Jews turned against him and the whole divine plan he proposed. When they refused to enter into his designs, God permitted the crime of deicide and by the supreme act of humble submission on Calvary, the supernatural life of grace was restored to the world. Fulfilling the prophecies to the letter, our Lord allowed himself to be put to death, but he died proclaiming the divine love for order. God wished the Jews as a people to accept his only begotten Son and to be the heralds of the supernatural, supernational life of his mystical body. They were thus offered the glorious privilege of proclaiming and working for the only mode of realizing the union and brotherhood of nations, which is possible since the fall. On account of their racial pride, they refused to accept that there could be any higher life than their national life, and they would not hear of the non-Jewish nations entering into the kingdom of the mystical body on the same level as themselves. The crucifixion of our Lord on Calvary was, however, not only the public rejection by the Jewish nation of the divine program for order in the world, but was at the same time the proclamation by that nation of its determination to work against God for the triumph of another Messiah. Since our Lord Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, is the source of the supernatural life through membership of his mystical body, the future Messiah must be anti-supernatural or naturalistic and membership of Christ will have to be eliminated in preparation for him. Since the true supernatural Messiah came to found the supranational kingdom of his mystical body, into which he asked the Jewish nation to lead all nation, the future Messiah must be a 
perfectly Jewish national Messiah, and his mission can have no other object than to impose the rule of the Jewish nation on other nations. The choice presented to the Jewish nation by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ may be represented diagrammically as follows. The Jewish nation, instructed by the prophets and figures of the Old Testament, and, lastly, by John the Baptist, was meant to turn upwards at the bidding of God become man, to put all its splendid natural qualities at the service of the true supernatural order of the world. Instead of doing so, it turned downwards to the slavery of a self-centered ambition dictated by national pride. The attitude of Saul prior to his conversion on the road to Damascus is typical of the corrupt ideas concerning the mission of the Messiah, which had been taken hold of Jewish minds and had led them to reject our Lord Jesus Christ. St. Paul saw the truth about the mystical body of Christ after his conversion and tried to get his fellow countrymen to recognize their error but the nation as such refused to listen. In his Christmas allocution, 1948, Pope Pius XII brought out the contrast between the alternatives that faced the Jewish nation at the coming of our Lord as follows. Here, resounding in the night like the bells of Christmas, the admirable world, words of the apostle to the Gentiles, who had been himself a slave to the mean, narrow prejudices of nationalistic and racial pride, stricken down along with him on the road to Damascus. He, Jesus Christ, is our peace, who hath made both peoples one, killing the enmities in himself, and coming, he preached peace to you, that were far off, and peace to them that were nigh. Ephesians 2, verse 14, 15, 16, 17. With that narrow national outlook dictated by ra racial pride, which Pope Pius XII said was stricken down with St. Paul on the road to Damascus, the Jewish nation has continued on down the centuries. That outlook has, in fact, become more extenuated with time. Accordingly, over and above the fundamental disorder of original sin, there is, in our fallen and redeemed world, an additional source of disorder in the determined opposition of his own nation, according to the flesh of the Redeemer and the source of order. Over and above the struggle against the self-centered tendencies of individual souls, the Catholic Church, the mystical body of Christ, has to face the persistent opposition of the Jewish nation. According to the leaders of the Jewish nation, now as 1,900 years ago, the union of the nations is not meant by God to take place through entrance into and acceptance of the supranational kingdom of our Lord's mystical body, but through acceptance of and submission to the naturalistic messianism of the Jewish nation. This is made very clear in a letter from the chief rabbi of Palestine, which appeared in the Irish Independent in Dublin of January 6, 1948. Ref referring to the establishment of the new state of Israel, Rabbi Herzog said, Eventually it will lead to the inauguration of the true union of nations through which will be fulfilled the eternal message to mankind of our immortal prophets. Jewish naturalism, or anti-supernaturalism, by its striving for a new messianic age, contains a twofold source of corruption and decay for other nations. 
on the one hand by its opposition to the supernatural life coming from our Lord, it strives directly against the light and strength by which alone individual life, individual, human, and national can be lived in, individ in order. On the other hand, whether the naturalistic Messiah to come be an individual Jew or the Jewish race, it means that the Jews, as a nation, are seeking to impose their particular national form on other nations. The imposition by any nation of its national form on another nation attacks directly the natural or normal line of development of that nation and undermines its natural virtues, which are the foundation and the bulwark of the supernatural virtues. Thus, in two ways, the Jews, as a nation, are objectively aiming at giving society a direction which is in complete opposition to the order proclaimed by God, become man. In spite of the unwavering naturalistic opposition of the Jewish nation, and notwithstanding the weakness of fallen human nature, in Western Europe in the 13th century, had accepted the program of Christ the King, and had organized society on that foundation. The organization was imperfect, as all the social stru structures of fallen and redeemed humanity will inevitably be, but it was some response to God's loving condescension. Since then, there has been steady decay. The uprise of Protestantism in the 16th century rent the unity of the mystical body of Christ. Chapter 16 of William Thomas Walsh's splendid work, Philip II, is entitled Freemasonry in the 16th century and shows that there was already at that time some sort of secret organization engaged in working for naturalism against ordered submission to Christ the King. He adds that it is no longer debatable that, if the false leaders of the Jews did not originate the secret societies to cover up their own anti-Christian activities and to influence credulous members of the Christian communities, they had a great deal to do with the business. The degrees and ritual of Freemasonry are shot through with Jewish symbolism. The candidate is going to the east, towards Jerusalem. He is going to rebuild the temple, destroyed in fulfillment of the prophecy of Christ. The Grand Orient and Scottish Rite Lodges sources of so many modern revolutions, are more militant, more open, and apparently more virulent than some of the others whom they are leading into a single world organization by gradual steps. From what we know today we can conclude that something very much like modern Freemasonry surely in spirit and probably to a great extent in form, existed in the lifetime of Philip II, 1527 to 1598. We, what we see, then, in the years following 1717 is rather the emergence into fuller light of a secret organized force aiming at enrolling and informing groups of adepts to work for naturalism, that is, for the denial of the supernatural life and the elimination of membership of Christ from society. The Jewish nation is a non-secret organized naturalistic force. That is to say, its naturalistic opposition to the mystical body of Christ is openly proclaimed. Freemasonry the organized naturalistic force acting in subordination to and in conjunction with the Jewish nation is a secret society or a group of societies, 
for its naturalism or anti-supernaturalism is secret or camouflaged. Relatively few of its members are fully aware of the naturalism of its end, its ritual and its symbolism. According to Anderson's Constitution of the Freemasons, the Masonic Society obliges, obliges its members to be good men and true, but insists that in order to be morally good men, it is a matter of indifference whether God's plan for the restoration of our supernatural life through our Lord Jesus Christ is accepted or not. Now, by original sin, we lost the supernatural life of grace, and we need that life of grace, that we may live an ordered life. Yet this society proclaims that a man can be good and true, that is, morally in order, while remaining utterly indifferent to the unique source of grace, our Lord Jesus Christ and his divinity. That is equivalent to a denial of the fall and is pure naturalism. In his great encyclical letter, Humanum Genus, on Freemasonry, issued in 1884, Pope Leo XIII insists that the naturalistic and the Masons, not accepting by faith those troops that have been made known to us by God's revelation, deny that the first Adam fell. Thus we see the fundamental error of Masonry, namely its naturalism. Again the great pontiff points out that the ultimate aim of Freemasonry is to root completely the whole religious and political order of the world which had been brought into existence by Christianity and to replace it by another in harmony with their way of thinking. This will mean that the foundation and laws of the new structure of society will be drawn from pure naturalism. That involves the elimination from society of every acknowledgment of the supernatural life of members of Christ. In the encyclical letter, moreover, Pope Leo XIII shows the opposition of Freemasonry to five out of the six principal points of the program for the Society of Christ the King. In regard to the fifth point, namely the diffusion of ownership, the Pope insists upon the fact that Freemasonry is not only not opposed to the plans of socialists and communists, but looks upon them with the greatest favor, as its leading principles are identical with theirs. That preparation and the triumph of the French Revolution were the work of Freemasonry does not need proof, since the Masons themselves boast of it. Accordingly, the Declaration of the Rights of Man is a Masonic production. When the Bastille fell, said Bonnet, the orator at the Grand Orient Assembly in 1904, Freemasonry had the supreme honor of giving to humanity the chart which it had lovingly elaborated. It was our brother, de la Fayette, who first presented the project of a declaration of the natural rights of man and the citizen living in society to be the first chapter of the Constitution. On August 25, 1789, the Constituent Assembly, of which more than 300 man members were Masons, definitely adopted, almost word for word, in the form determined upon in the lodges the text of the immortal declaration of the rights of man. Given the naturalism of Freemasonry, the declaration, then, is simply a formal renunciation of allegiance to Christ the King, of supernatural life, and of membership of his mystical body. The French state 
thereby officially declared that it no longer acknowledged any duty to God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and no longer recognized the dignity of membership of Christ in its citizens. It thus inaugurated the attack on the organization of society under Christ the King, which has continued down to the present day. That was only the first step. The subservience of Freemasonry with regard to the Jews, writes Fabé Joseph Lehmann, soon showed itself. How? When the question of Jewish emancipation came to be examined by the Constituent Assembly, 1789 to 1791, the deputies who took upon themselves the tasks of getting it voted were all Freemasons. Mirabeau gave it the per persevering help of his eloquence, and Mirabeau was a Freemason of the higher degrees, intimate with Weishaupt and his associates, and closely linked up with the Jews of Berlin. When, after having hesitated for two years, the Constituent Assembly, in its last in its second last meeting, was still hesitating. It was a Freemason and Jacobin, A. Duport, who demanded the vote with threats. Such was the first secret service rendered to Judaism by Freemasonry. After that, one uh, others will follow. By the Revolution of 1789, then, the French state not only decreed the ostracism of the true supernatural Messiah and his program, but admitted to full citizenship the members of the Jewish nation, allowing them to work freely for the anti-supernatural domination of their nation. Modern history since 1789 is, to a large extent, the accountability of the domination of state after state by the anti-supernatural supranationalism of Freemasonry, behind which has been steadily emerging the still more strongly organized anti-supernatural supranationalism of the Jewish nation. This is why the post-revolutionary epoch has witnessed, in country after country, persistent attacks upon the program of Christ the King. After every successful Masonic revolution, since the first in 1789, down to and including the Spanish Revolution in 1931, the world soon began to hear of the countries entering upon the path of progress. By the introduction of enlightened reforms, such as the separation of church and state, or the putting of all religions on the same level, the legalization of divorce, the secularization of the schools, the suppression and banishment of religious orders and congregations, the glorification of Freemasonry, the nationalization of property, and the unrestricted license of the press. The process of elimination of the union of nations through the mystical body of Christ and the substitution, therefore, of the naturalistic domination of the Jewish nation, seems to be now on the verge of triumph. Back in 1922, the Assembly of the Grand Lodge of France insisted that amongst the tasks lying ahead was the creation of a European spirit, the formation of the United States of Europe, rather the Federation of the World, on this side of the Iron Curtain, and in the USA, nations are being invited to give up their national sovereignty to enter a federation in which those who control world masonry will certainly yield enormous power, and in which the authentic teacher of the moral law would not be listened to. On the far side of the Iron Curtain, we see the continuation of what was stated by Mr. Odendyke, the Dutch minister of St. Petersburg, 
and published in the British White Paper of April 1919. Unless Bolshevism is nipped in the bud immediately, it is bound to spread in one form or another all over Europe and the whole world, as it is organized and worked by Jews who have no nationality and whose one object is to destroy for their own ends the existing order of things. In G.K.'s Weekly, February 4, 1937, Mr. Hilaire Belloc wrote, As for anyone who does not know that the present revolutionary Bolshevik movement is Russia, in Russia is Jewish, I can only say that he must be a man who is taken in by the suppressions of our deplorable press. Anyone who carefully studies the rulers of Russia and of the satellite states Poland and Hungary, for example, at the present day, will have the same conclusion forced upon him. The opposition of all the branches of Freemasonry, French, Italian, Anglo-Saxon, etc., to the Catholic Church is essential and irredacable for it is the opposition of naturalism to the supernatural life of the mystical body of Christ and to the organization of society based on the infinite dignity of that life. In other words, it is the opposition of Antichrist to Christ. It will be well to stress this great truth because of the statements one sometimes hears that English and American Freemasonry is quite different from Continental Freemasonry. In the encyclical letter Humanum Genus, Pope Leo XIII condemns the naturalism of Freemasonry and not only makes no distinction between the different branches of Freemasonry, but teaches that no such distinction is to be made. He alludes to the controversy about God, or rather about the ancient landmark of the great architect of the universe, between Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry and the French Grand Orient, but says that the fact that there has recently been a controversy about such a fundamental truth of the natural order as the existence of God is clear proof of the inevitably corrupting influence of Masonic naturalism or anti-supernaturalism. The Pope does not exempt from condemnation the sections of Freemasonry that retain the ancient landmark. No, the condemnation of Freemasonry in the encyclical is universal without any attenuation in favor of what is called Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry. The text of Pope Leo XIII, with regard to God, runs as follows. Although, as a rule, they, the Freemasons, admit the existence of God, they themselves openly confess that they do not all firmly assent to this truth, and hold it with unwavering conviction for they do not attempt to hide the fact that this question of God is the chief source and cause of discord among them. Nay, it is well known that recently it has been the subject of a serious disagreement in their ranks. As a matter of fact, however, they allow their members the greatest license on the point, so that they are at liberty to hold that God exists or that God does not exist, and those who obstinately affirm that there is no God are admitted just as readily as those who, while asserting that there is a God, nevertheless have wrong ideas about him, like the pantheists. This is purely and simply the suppression of the truth about God, while holding on to an absurd caricature of the divine nature. It is regrettable that the encyclical on Freemasonry is omitted from the collection of the letters of Pope Leo the Thirteenth, 
published by the Bruce Publishing Company, Milwaukee, and that the reverend editor seems to write, in the note on page 272, as if there were an essential difference between Freemasonry in English-speaking countries and elsewhere. At least his words may leave some readers under that impression. Naturalism is the fundamental error of, free, of Masonry and is common to all section of the craft. Corruption of the idea of God has inevitably followed on the rejection of the one way instituted for return to God, namely, membership of the mystical body of Christ. The French Grand Orient has betrayed the presence of this corruption and degradation with regard to God more openly than Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry. That is the whole significance of the controversy about the deletion of the French Grand Orient of the expression, the great architect of the universe. The retention of the Grand Lodge of England, then, of the article relating to the great architect of the universe, does not signify that English Masonry is Christian, for English Masonry does not accept the supremacy of the mystical body of Christ. On the contrary, English Masonry is anti-supernatural and anti-Christian, like the other sections of the Masonic Brotherhood for it puts Muhammad and Buddha on the same level as Christ, thus denying Christ's role as the one mediator. Neither does this article mean that English masonry professes belief in a transcendent God as we know him, for it is compatible with acceptance of pantheism, that is, with the identification of God with man. The retention of the vague term, Great Architect of the Universe, enables English Freemasonry to pose as religious, while continuing to work of sapping the belief of Englishmen in the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in the reality of that supernatural life of grace coming to us from Him, by which we are truly men as we ought to be. Ample proofs of the relations between Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry and Latin Grand Orient Freemasonry are to be found in La Dictionnaire des Puissances Occultes by Count de Poncins. He points out, for example, that if we open the English Masonic calendar for 1930, we find the Grand Reli Grand Lodge has official relations with Portugal, Spain, with the remnant of Italian Freemasonry, and with Latin America. In addition to the evidence adduced by the Count de Poncins, we know that the English Grand Lodge maintains friendly relations with the Swiss Grand Lodge, Alpina, which recognizes not only the Grand Lodge of France, but the Grand Orients of France, Spain, and Greece. Thus, between Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry and Latin Freemasonry, there are indirect but effective relations which are far closer than is admitted. Once, the disorder of the Masonic naturalism or anti-supernaturalism is grasped, we can easily understand its varying modes of procedure with regard to governments. With tongue and pen, declares the Freemason Pike, the Inner Sanctuary, chapter 4, page 554. With all our open and secret influences, with the purse and, if need be, with the sword, we will advance the cause of human progress and labor to enfranchise human thought, 
to give freedom to the human conscience above all from papal usurpations and equal rights to the people everywhere the formation in tolerance given in the lodge aims not merely at the negative mental state which puts religious truth and error on the same level treats them both with indifference it aims at the production of a positive hatred of what it calls the intolerance of the catholic church namely catholic the catholic church's insistence on the divine plan for order the formation in masonic tolerance then is really a formation in hatred of the firmness and strength of the catholic church in standing for the supernatural life and the order of the world this is the ultimate reason why anglo-saxon masonry ostensibly so conservative has constantly favored movements towards the left opposed to the true order of the world the effect of the ambiguous naturalistic formation of masonry in regard to the state accompanied as it is by denunciations of tyranny and usurpation corresponding to the denunciations of superstition and tolerance in regard to religion will be to favor the same tendency to the left states will be assailed as tyrannies in proportion to the extent in which they accept our Lord's program for order. In Catholic countries, violent revolution will always be aimed at in order to get rid of the existing social structure in which the kingship of Christ is respected. As, owing to their rejection of our Lord's program for order, the advent of naturalism in protestant countries is only a question of time the terms tyranny and despotism may not be applied to them by masonry as freely as they were to the realms of the bourbons and the habsburgs but the protestant countries will not be spared for behind Freemasonry is the more cohesive naturalistic force of the Jewish nation with its messianic aim of domination over all nations. Any vestige of the rule of the true supernatural Messiah must be swept away. A highly placed personage, whose name he does not reveal, said to the distinguished historian Cardinal Petra, at Vienna in 1889 the Catholic nations must be crushed by the Protestant nations when this result has been attained a breath will be sufficient to bring about the disappearance of Protestantism Freemasons in England and the USA will yield to pressure from leaders of the Jewish nation even when the interests of England and the USA obviously suffer. The Brooklyn Tablet, May 14, 1949, quoted the frank statements of the American Senate of Senator Owen Brewster of Maine, a non-Catholic. Speaking of the attitude towards Spain, the Senator said, Spain is not recognized because Spain is a Catholic country. The subtle wor word is constantly passed that the alternative to communism is Catholicism. We know the word is constantly uttered in the lobbies, although senators do not care to bring it out on the floor. There is not space to treat of the Masonic plan that is being pursued in Ireland six Ulster counties have been detached from the rest of the country and erected into a state with a government in which Masonic influence is predominant the Orange Society it must be borne in mind is a sub masonry trained for anti-Catholic action 
all the countries of Ulster were not included in the state lest the Catholics should have a majority in Parliament. The Catholic Irish justly resent the partition of their country. Pressure will be brought to bear upon them to placate the Freemasons by compromising still further to the program of Christ the King and abandoning the unity and indissolubility of marriage. Those who are alert know that Senator H. Lehman's interest in undoing the partition of Ireland is ominous. He is described in Common Sense of November 15, 1949, as a banker Zionist long friendly to Moscow. If Monsignor Dillon were alive today, he would tell the Catholic Irish to remember all their obligations to our divine Lord Jesus Christ, who sustained their fathers through centuries of trial, and to placate him first not the Zionists, Communists, and the Freemasons. On account of the confusion of mind prevalent among Catholics concerning the question of anti-Semitism, a few words must be said about it before concluding this preface. In the excellent review of my books, The Kingship of Christ and, Na and Organized Naturalism, which appeared in the Jesuit magazine La Civilta Catolica in Rome in March 1947, the reviewer laid special stress on the, di on the distinction which I have been making in all my books. He wrote as follows. The author wants a clear distinction to be made between hatred of the Jewish nation, which is anti-Semitism, and opposition to Jewish and Masonic naturalism. This opposition on the part of Catholics must be maintained positive by acknowledging, not only individually, but socially, the rights of the supernatural kingship of Christ and his Church, and by striving politically to get these rights acknowledged by states and in public life. For this indispensable undertaking, the active and effective union of Catholics is absolutely necessary. Space does not allow of lengthy quotations from papal documents to show that, on the one hand, the sovereign pontiff insists that Catholics must stand unflinchingly for the integral rights of Christ the King, as contained in the papal encyclicals, while on the other hand, keeping their minds and hearts free from hatred of our Lord's own nation, according to the flesh. On the one hand, they must battle for the rights of Christ the King and the supernatural organization of society, as laid down in the encyclical Quas Primas, unequivocally proclaiming the rejection of our Lord Jesus Christ, the true Messiah, by his own nation, and the unyielding opposition of that nation to him, are a fundamental source of disorder and conflict in the world. On the other hand, as members of our Lord Jesus Christ, Catholics should neither hate the members of the nation, in which, through our Blessed Mother, the Lily of Israel, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Trinity assumed human nature, nor deny them their legitimate rights as persons. The supernatural elevation of mind and heart, and the unshrinking fortitude that are required from members of Christ in our day, can be maintained only with the aid of him who wept over Jerusalem's rejection of order. It will inevitably mean suffering for Christ's faithfulness, Christ's faithful members, and the power of the anti-supernatural forces in the world increases. Even bear in mind of their suffering, however, 
Christ members must bear in mind that there will be a glorious triumph for Christ the King when, as St. Paul tells us in his epistle to the Romans, chapter 11, verse 33, there will be a sincere return on the part of the Jewish nation to the mystical body of the true Messiah. Two reasons can be assigned to the fact that our Lord's faithful members will often be betrayed by those who should be on the side of Christ the King. Firstly, many Catholic writers speak of papal condemnations of anti-Semitism without explaining the meaning of the term and never even allude to the documents which insist on the rights of our Divine Lord, head of the mystical body, priest and king. Thus, very many are completely ignorant of the duty incumbent on all Catholics of standing, positively, for our Lord's reign in heaven and secret in society in opposition to Jewish naturalism, the result is that the number of Catholics are so ignorant of Catholic doctrine that they hurl the accusation of anti-Semitism against those who are battling for the rights of Christ the King, thus effectively aiding the enemies of our Divine Lord. Secondly, many Catholic writers copy unquestioningly what they read in the naturalistic or anti-supernatural press and do not distinguish between anti-Semitism in the correct Catholic sense, as explained above, and anti-Semitism as the Jews understand it. For the Jews, anti-Semitism is anything that is in opposition to the naturalistic messian messianic domination of their nation over all the others. Quite logically, the leaders of the Jewish nation hold that to stand for the rights of Christ, the king is to be anti-Semitic. The term anti-Semiticism, with all its smear connections to, in the minds of the unthinking, is being extended to include any form of opposition to the Jewish nation's naturalistic aims and any exposure of the methods they adopt to achieve these aims. In our time, more than ever before, said the saintly Pius X at the beatification of Joan of Arc, December 13, 1908, the greatest asset of the evil disposed is the cowardice and weakness of good men, and all the rigor of Satan's reign is due to the easy-going weakness of Catholics. Oh, if I might ask the Divine Redeemer, as the prophet Zachary did in spirit, what are those wounds in the midst of thy hands? The answer would not be doubtful. With these I was wounded in the house of them that loved me. I was wounded by my friends, who did nothing to defend me, and who, on every occasion, made themselves the accomplices of my adversaries. And this reproach can be leveled at the weak and timid Catholics of all countries. Dennis Fahey, The Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, June 16th. 1950.